Good afternoon to all. On behalf of Intas Pharmaceutical Limited, I, Dr. Dilen Kanami from Medical Affairs Team, welcome you all to this live webinar program. More than 4 million positive cases and more than 3 lakh deaths. I think coronavirus crisis, COVID-19 crisis, is the biggest black swan event in 100 years. I think right now, everything is about COVID-19. COVID-19 has impacted our life in never thought before. And it has also impacted how physicians treat patients and how surgeons perform surgery. And so it is important that all the physicians, they come together and share their learning in these times of COVID-19. I think right now we have a time that we can share learnings, our clinical pulse with each other. That is the main aim of today's webinar. The way, a topic of today's webinar is treatment of advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, current, standard, and future perspective. Speaker of the day is Dr. Arun. Dr. Arun is an assistant professor of gastroenterology at Department of Digestive Health and Diseases, Chennai. To moderate the session, we have with us Dr. C.B. Thoran, who is a consultant gastroenterologist at Kamatsi Hospital, Memorial Hospital, Chennai. We also have with us Dr. Krishna, who is also a consultant gastroenterologist at Kim Savera Hospital, Anandpur. There will be a question and answer session after deliberation by Dr. Arun. So I request all the viewers to write your questions in the comment box. The comment box is in the right side of the video that is played. On that note, now I'll hand over to Dr. Krishna for the moderation of the session and to begin the event. Over to you, Dr. Krishna. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we'll be having a, one of the important topics in, in hepatology, that is management of hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatocellular carcinoma is one of the important patients in patients of cirrhosis. Unlike other solid organ tumors, generally in solid organ tumors, we have the management depends upon the size of the tumor, the nodal involvement, and the metastasis. However, Hepatocellular carcinoma, more than that, it is the liver function, the baseline child flow score will decide what will be the management. To understand, we have a, uh, we, we, uh, if we have a case of 2 cm liver sol in a compensated cirrhosis, the management is of it is entirely different from a similar 2 cm liver sol in a decompensated cirrhosis. And the important part is, majority of cases are diagnosed in advanced stages. So, it is very pertinent to discuss regarding the management of advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. For this, I invite Dr. Arun to take over this virtual, virtual stage and proceed with this talk. Thank you. Good afternoon, respected professors, senior consultants, and my dear friends. It's once again an immense pleasure for me to meet you all in this, even in this COVID era, uh, even with your busy practice, even with your multiple uh, issues is being happening in the COVID era. So we are here to discuss something about advances in hepatocellular carcinoma, the current standards and future. And without the moderators, uh, this session is won't be a complete one. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Krishna. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Sibithuran, who is being a main, who is going to play the main key role for the discussion right now. Also, I would like to thank all the organizers who are being involved involved in us to discuss an area which is none other than hepatocellular carcinoma. So, what I am going to discuss right now, we are going to discuss the part of advances in hepatocellular carcinoma. I mean, advanced is CC. What is the current standard and future? So what do you mean by this advanced hepatocellular carcinoma? As you are well aware, if the patient presents to us with the BCLC, which is nothing but Barcelona clinic liver staging system, 
So if you are, if the patient doesn't present to the BCLC staging C, which means if the patient is having major vascular invasion along with a extra hepatic metastasis, there is a high progression for the patient to go for advanced in which none of the therapy, even resection or transplantation will not be helpful for that kind of presentation. What we are going to do, it's, a, it's what we have been defined as advanced epithelial carcinoma. Once the patient being presents to us with advanced epithelial carcinoma, how are you going to tackle that? How are you going to manage? And before starting, I would like to do, uh, consider with you all a brief discussion about epithelial. It is nothing but the third most common uh, cancer and the second most common cancer liver related, um, for the liver related deaths. And apart from that, and more than 90% of the liver related deaths is mainly because of the epithelial carcinoma among the cancer, cancer guidelines. And next to that, the incidence of uh, uh, epithelial carcinoma among males and females will be slightly preponderant in males. And the rate of progression of cirrhosis in, I um, mean, uh, cirrhosis to epithelial carcinoma in India, it is almost 1.6 percentage per year as per the multiple guidelines. So why do you want to insist on all those things? Because there are so much of etiologies for epithelial carcinoma and major common etiology will be hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and aflatoxin and other things will be involved. Even alcohol will be considered as a co-carcinogen to be involved in the epithelial carcinoma. And even if the patient develops advanced epithelial carcinoma, there are multiple regimens, chemotherapeutic regimens, various drugs are being trialed for which we are going to discuss right now. So it's one of the highest incidents in Asia and Southern Africa. So more than 30 by 1 lakh population have been proven and intermediate incidence in the US, Northern Canada and part of Europe as in, and it will be approximately three to 30 uh, per 1 lakh population has been proven. So this is the basic algorithm. As we all know that regarding epithelial carcinoma to be discussed, there are multiple staging system being existing. So among that, the one which we are going to use very frequently is, is nothing but a BCLC. And apart from that, there are many stagings are there like Okuda, I mean, Japanese clinical staging and American society classification, click staging, multiple stages. Click staging is mainly based upon your child folk score and uh, Okuda staging is mainly because of, based upon the tumor size, the albumin and other thing, other parameters can be taken into an account if you are going for Okuda and other classification. So basically, if you're going to think about the BCLC, so you'll be categorized based upon the stage of the tumor and how about the liver function? See, in advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, once a portal vessel, once a major vessel be involved along with the astrohepatic metastasis, but the liver function and the performance is still be well retained for most of the patient. So once the liver function is preserved and if the performance, look for the performance status and look for the tumor burden. Based upon that, the BCLC staging is being in use. And we'll be categorizing that very early, early, intermediate, advanced, and terminal stage. So what is it very early? So based upon the performance and ECOG, I mean, it's a, a Eastern Control, uh, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group Society, based upon the performance status, which means uh, they'll be having on four, I mean, uh, on four performance status will be there. So if the patient is mildly restrained and to the severe restraint and we couldn't be able to do any other activities. So based upon the performance status and based upon the solidarity, I mean, when the nodule, based on the liver size, based upon your SOA lesion size, so if the, liver, if the lesion size, if it is less than two centimeters, so we will be either go for resection or we may try for ablation of the tumor. And if the, suppose in the early stage, either we will go for transplant or we may go for ablation. In early stage means the preserved liver function is still there. And if it is a solitary nodule, or if the two or three nodules, if it is going to be there, which is size is going to less than three centimeters. And once a patient has been progressed to intermediate stage, it means a multinodularity, and there is high possibility we need to go for TASE at all. So TASE is transatural chemoembolization can be used. And this is one trend, one thing which we are going to discuss because advanced stages of tumors, we can combine a TASE at all along with a systemic therapy. There are so many trials being going on the field, but the beneficial effect once a patient entered into the advanced stage, uh, whether the combination therapy is validated or not, is still a major questionable issue. And if the patient is progressing to advanced stage means, I mean, ECOG, the performance status is slightly going to come down, the preserved liver function is still there, and the macrovascular invasion will be there, and extra hepatic spread could be a possibility. So once a patient enters into the advanced stage, there are multiple modalities of treatment. The first line will always, as we are well aware, and most of the centers in India will be using this drug. And without the, this, this drug, the regimen will not be happening. And sorafenib, and there are other trials is going for lenvacinib, and and the second line drugs like regorofenib, cabastinib, and uh, uh, ramuzasimab, and many other drugs are being tried. 
And regarding the terminal stage, always the best support you care or gender loving care is still in is still existing. So the regarding the estimated time for survival, once a patient is being progressed to do uh, advanced stage, the chances of five years survival it will be, will be always less than fifteen percentage. So the chances of five years survival will be always coming down once a patient is going to enter into the advanced stage. So what are the various challenges we are going to face? So this is the competing cause of death. So because whether we are not very sure whether to see among hepatic cellular carcinoma, we need to divide. It is because of cirrhotic or because of non-cirrhotic, as what Dr. Krishna has said before. So if it is because of cirrhotic, the possibility of hepatic cellular carcinoma uh, in a cirrhotic background is around 80 to 90 percentage. So we need to see the competing cause with the cirrhosis versus SCC. And we couldn't be able to predict the function because the metabolism will be arch once it start once the tumor because of multiple etiologies. And next to that, the inherent drug resistance. Suppose if you are going to put a patient with a drug, whether the patient is going to respond over to the function of the liver, whether it is there or not, based upon that, there are so much challenges when you are going to put a patient uh, with a drug. And heterogeneous pattern, or, uh, heterogeneous pattern of disease. Always you should remember, hepatocellular cellular carcinoma is unique and heterogeneous in the various presentation and difficult to get tumor specimen most of the time. So if you're planning to treat a patient with SSC, it is always a multidisciplinary approach. The multiple teams are going to involve as a surgical gastro, medical gastro, hepat and tumor registry, oncologists, radiation oncologists, everyone is going to involve in the management protocol. And next to that, so what are all the various options being available? Now, I'm not going to discuss anything else apart from the advanced, unresectable hepatic cellular carcinoma, the various chemotherapeutic regimens, what we are going to use, what we are going to try. And the first line of therapy, as we all know that the SHARP trial, it's a sonafinib in advanced hepatic cellular carcinoma, a randomized protocol study. So based upon that, so always we are going to consider sorafinib as a first line of therapy. Is a, but the one thing always in advanced stage, the child books B, we are still considering sorafinib, but there are some trials being using even for child, I mean, child books A, it's the main, main modality to be considered. And even for some patients with child books B, we can also consider. And the other modality is like lenvacinib, it's still more consistent. And uh, right now, along with sorafinib, there are many centers being trying with sorafinib. Uh, Lenvacinib also, and the overall survival with Lenvacinib is slightly good when compared to Sorafinib. Nowadays, there are much, many trials have been there, and those things I'll be uh, discussing uh, in my further slides. So regarding the Sorafinib, see also, you should always remember that any tumor, if the tumor wants to proliferate, it is mainly based upon uh, angiogenesis, which means there will be a pre-existing vessels. In the pre-existing vessels, if any new vessels is going to sprout out, it is nothing but angiogenesis. For a tumor has to grow, it has to be suppressed by immunosuppressive activity, and uh, it has to have an anti-apoptotic pathway, it has to be in uh, angiogenetic, angiogenetic pathway, so many things are there for the tumor to grow. So this is mainly based upon the angiogenesis inhibition mechanism. It's nothing but a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and which decreases the tumor cell proliferation. So if you're going to look into this diagram, the flow chart, so you will be seeing the multiple pathways, the RAS, RAF, kinase, every pathway, MET and ERK, based upon the nucleus, and what is going to involve, whether this is a tumor cell or an endothelial. As you know, the endothelial cell pathway is mainly based upon the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor, PDGF, and that's nothing but platelet derived growth factor receptor. It is going to inhibit the proliferation of this endothelial cell. Also, it is prevents migration and metastasis, and also it is an inhibitor of all the angiogenetic pathway. So that is the main role, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. As we all know that what is a sharp trial? As you let's see, if you are going, there are two uh, endpoints we are supposed to take. If you are going to pay, start a patient with a drug, we need to see the primary endpoint as well as we need to see the secondary endpoint, which means the overall survival and time to symptomatic progression and the secondary endpoint like time to progression and disease control rate as well as the safety issues has to be controlled. See, sorafenib has been tried in multiple, even from 2008 to 2011 itself, the drug has been validated and sorafenib, uh, it's a multi-specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor which regulates tumor proliferation as well as angiogenesis. So mainly in sharp red, what we are going to use in child status A, if the performance is performance status of the patient, if it is going to be less than two, which means a good performance and no other prior systemic treatment. And without any prior systemic treatment, and if you're going to suspect the patient is going to have a life expectancy for more than 12 weeks, you can go, you can go ahead with sorafinib therapy. So sorafinib, you are going to initiate 
we discharge the dose of 400 mg bd and some centers they are still trying 400 mg only because of the side effect but ideally in short run they have been drinking with 400 mg bd with the placebo is going to be compared so if you are going to compare with the sorafenib see the survival rate and progression will be reasonably good in sorafenib when compared to any other drugs so the treatment associated with improved overall survival is nearly all in selected subgroups including those with poor outcome status and macroscopic vascular aberration so the median survival will be approximately 10.7 months when compared to the placebo will be approximately 7.7 7.9 so definitely there is a uh, uh, reasonable survival improvement when you are going to use a sorafenib in the advanced hepatic cell lung cancer no carcinoma management protocol and Regarding this, how this subgroup is being analyzed? See, in short trial, you need to analyze based upon uh, what is the etiological factor you are going to treat, uh, which made you to trigger the hepatic cell carcinoma, and based upon the vascular invasion status, based upon the ECOG scoring, and whether it is because of other etiology. Because in short trial, the response rate, because will be good, will be in alcohol and hepatitis C and other things. Rather than in hepatitis B, the response is slightly poor in hepatitis B trial rather than in uh, hepatitis A, I mean hepatitis C as well as uh, alcohol related etiology. So based upon all these things, we need to assess the overall survival. So if you're going to see the overall survival and in all these things, the sorafenib will be definitely is going to have a, a strong impact in the management of advanced hepatitis cell carcinoma. Regarding the adverse reactions, I will be discussing with you. It's very common for all the chemotherapeutic regimen, either it will go for arterial hypertension, the patient can experience diarrhea, and sometimes the patient can experience fatigability, and the patient can experience unfoot reaction. That's one of the characteristics. It's one of the frequently discussed area in the management of epitocellular carcinoma. That too, when you are going to use a drug like sorafenib, so many things are there, and sometimes the liver function will be still worsening, hypobilinemia can be increased, the acidities may be persisting, and based upon how do you go into the tumor, I mean, the treatment-related uh, em treatment emergent adverse Events. Seeing that once you pay, once you initiate the patient on any therapy, so we need to assess the TEAE, which means the treatment emergent adverse events. So based upon that, there will be a four, the four to five staging system are there. So based upon that, how are you going to tackle? What is the presentation is there, and in which TEAE the patient will be in right now stands, and after initiation of the drug, all those things has to be assessed before you are going to start the patient on. I mean, uh, before you are going to come to the patient with management protocol. And next to that, see in this um, shop, there is almost study for the Asia Pacific, I mean Asia population, uh, the HPV related, uh, in hepatitis B virus related patient also, uh, when you're going to use sorafenib, there is a reasonable survival improvement of nine months when compared also in HCV around 14 months. See, but one thing, there is a CTN and B1 mutation. This is one of the theoretical part. And what I'm saying is if the patient, see, this is the one which is going to uh, drive the gene, which means going to model the gene, a gene of expression. And now the CTNN is being involved in the telomerase activation pathway and many other pathways being involved in that. So if there is a modification with WNT signaling and output of humans, I mean, epitocellular carcinoma, growth suppression in the patient with HCV is still more validated. So as you all know that the common symptoms is fatigue, weight loss, and dermatological symptoms, alopecia will be there, and diarrhea, anorexia, nausea, vomiting. So you regarding the treatment, one is tyrosine kinase, and next to that is checkpoint inhibitors based upon the immunotherapy. So now we are discussing about the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. There are, these are all the drugs which we need to, I mean now. So these are the most common adverse effects when you are going to tackle a patient with sorafenib. So how are you going to manage this and food skin reaction? So if it is usually a hyperkeratosis and skin inflammatory pathology, and you will be using a topical emollients like a urea, ammonium containing lactate or salicylic acid. And sometimes the topical steroids will be useful if the inflammation is still high. And if it is intolerable, we need to withhold the uh, uh, for some days, at least approximately seven days until symptoms improve. Or else after that, we can restart the therapy at a lower dose uh, in case of HFR, if the patient is going to develop and you're going to initiate with sorafenib. And uh, if the, see, this is, I mean, Asia Pacific study, which has been conducted in China and Korea, along with that. So in China also. So what they've been telling, what they've been taking to an account child book status with the good ECOG performance and no previous treatment and life expectancy of more than 12 weeks. So when you're going to put the patient sorafenib more than 400 milligrams, 
there is a definite improvement in overall survival and time to progression and time to symptomatic progression and disease control rate as well as the safety things and so this is what we have been discussed the shorter survival duration than the control group in the short trial and in Asia study 73 percent of the people were predominantly HPV positive so Overall, from 2007 to 2017, the overall I mean sorafenib outcomes will be a, will be reasonably good uh, in Asian patients as well as in Western patients. So this is a global prospective study in sorafenib. This is Gideon. Why we are being going to use this Gideon study is nothing but suppose you are going, there are multiple trials been happening for only child status E. What do you mean by child status? Child proof criteria is based upon three major things. I mean, five major things. One is bilirubin acid it is encapsulated by the INR and uh, INR prothrombin chime and other thing. Suppose if, uh, if the value is going to be around five and more than eight, and if it's going to be around 15, uh, the three stages will be there. And based upon the child status A or B or C, if you are going to take your child status A, most of the time the sort of is well potent. But what about the child B? What is the option for the child B patients? What about, what about the option for child C patients? Child C usually the sorafenib therapy usually not much of benefit and no not indicated at all. And in cases of child B status, this is a global prospective study has done a reasonable research for that in sorafenib in unresectable SSC from 2008 to 2015. So actually they have been taking the phase one, two, three, four and objectives. So in that site initiation and uh, child books pattern assessment. And phase three, they'll be taking around 1,500 patients. And phase two, around 500, then 1,500. And with this, they go, with this they'll be assessing the uh, data. So based upon this Gideon staging, I um, mean, Gideon trial, so what you're going to do that is nothing but in childhood, say, uh, overall survival is nothing but around approximately 10.3 months in uh, compared to child B, it is only around 4.8 and child C is around two months. So this is our usual, so that's why uh, the role of sorafenib is more important in child A patient rather than in child B and C. So this is another thing based upon the treatment emergent adverse events. See, when you're going to look for this, uh, if you're going to see there's a serious adverse reactions will be more common when you're going to initiate the patient with sorafenib will be more in child B status rather than in child A and uh, uh, the normal patients. So there are other challenges. The first line random is the phase three, the combination regimens. What are the things we can try? The multiple trials being done and like that, I mean, sunichinib with sorafenib can be tried and brivanib with sorafenib with the bridge trial can be tried and linifenib with sorafenib and sorafenib with elatinib. Everything has been tried, but the overall survival, it's not much of benefit when compared to the initial thing. Uh, suppose if you are going to die, I mean, sunitinib in the oral survival will be less when compared to sorafenib and brivanib, that is also less, and linifenib will be also less, and sorafenib plus elotinib will be having a slightly more progression but, uh, of survival, but the overall beneficial effect, the time to progression of events is still more questionable when you are going. What about the doxorubicin? There are multiple single dose regimens are there, like doxorubicin, oxaloplatin, so many drugs are being in single dose regimen be tried in the management of hepatocellular carcinoma, but the beneficial effects, it's still a questionable issue. But the overall survival, when you're going to combine a doxorubicin with sorafenib or isolated sorafenib, so isolated sorafenib management is slightly more potent than a doxorubicin based trials. So next to that, after sorafenib, the other second FD approved, which is being used in India, the only drug which is going to available as a primary first line of therapy, and it is going to still improve the overall survival when compared to the basic initial prototype sorafenib is none other than lenvatinib. If you're going to use lenvatinib, it is also a multi-kinase inhibitor. It is also going to target the pathway of VGFR1, VGFR3, and FIG fibroblast growth factor receptor, and PDGFR receptor. And if you're going to use lenvatinib, no doubt about that, there is a good response in primary, as a good response in secondary, and the overall survival is definitely going to improve, and time to progression of the disease is definitely going to improve in, as per the modified resist. What do you mean by modified resist? So uh, it means well, it mean evaluation of the solid tumor. So if you're going to evaluate in a solid tumor, there is a significant endpoint, I mean, significant progression to your survival when you're going to use uh, lenvatinib. So there's a beautiful trial for lenvatinib, none other than so reflect trial. If you're going to use reflect 
in reflect trial there is a being targeting a adult patient with unrestrictable hcc and no prior systemic therapy and child status a and bclc a the b or c can be taken into account i mean very i mean uh, b or c patients and uh, ecog performance mean uh, in the range of 0 to 1 so if you are going to put the patient with lenvatinib so dose of lenvatinib is if the patient is less than 60 kg we can use approximately 8 mg if the patient is more than 60 kg we can go for uh, 12 mg of uh, lenvatinib if you are going to target lenvatinib if you are going to use lenvatinib it's a multi target and as i told you and the primary endpoints and the secondary endpoints is definitely going to improve with the reflex study see in this if you are just assessing that the overall survival when compared to serafinib it is almost up to 13.6 when compared to serafinib which is almost only uh, 12.3 So these are all the common adverse effects. There's nothing much to discuss. The same thing as hand foot screen, hypertension, diarrhea, appetite alteration, and weight loss, fatigueability, alopecia. And proteinuria is one more important entity. Around 20% of the patient, when the patient is going to subject with lenvatinib, uh, there is possibility of proteinuria. And dysphonia also cases reported. Around 10 to 15% of the patient dysphonia has also cases reported there. So nausea can be there for most of the patients. And So, what are the other molecules being in trial? So, the, the key phase three trial assessing emergent agents for regimen for first line therapy. So, what are the other drugs like nevolumab and gilolumab plus tamolimumab? These are all the anti PDL. That means any programmed cell death apoptosis. Being based on anti PDL1 and anti CL TTL4 antibodies. These are all the drugs being tried. And uh, apart from that, atezolizumab and bevacizumab also been in trial. But the as for now, nivolumab there are much studies is being there. And nivolumab, some said, I mean, uh, uh, it's being available in uh, US and in India. Uh, not much of centers are being experiencing that. And nivolumab and tamolimumab and, and uh, these are still in trials in Himalaya. Himalayan trials is going on for nivolumab check my trials and uh, for atezolizumab and bevacizumab is in brave trial. So, what are the first line combination? That's nothing but Gonex trial. See, if it has been assessed in a population of around 95 people, in that they are being combining gemcitabine with oxaliplatin with sorafenib. So, gemox with sorafenib. So, what have been uh, analyzing that? The slightly overall improvement, the progression fee survival rate, it's more it will be around 60 percentage when compared to 54 in the sorafenib monotherapy. So, and Gonex trial is still slightly in higher potential. But uh, whether it is validated or not, it's still a questionable thing. <coughs> What are the other second line therapy which is being available? Is not I mean like uh, cabazitinib, I mean cabazitinib and sorafenib, and I mean other drugs like uh, ramucirumab, nivolumab, uh, pembrolizumab. Multiple drugs are there. For cabazitinib, what is the trial is celestial. For ramucirumab, ramucirumab is reach two. And for nivolumab is checkmate forty, and for pembrolizumab is key note two to four. <coughs> so for pembrolizumab is mainly a child who's A, and for nivolumab is either for child who's B, A or B, and for ramucirumab the one thing which we are taking into account is alpha fetal protein level, whether it is less than two hundred or if it is going to be more than four hundred. Because based upon the alpha fetal protein, if the alpha fetal protein level, if it is in the higher range, the possibility of increased overall survival with ramucirumab is slightly high. And the sorafenib patients and cabozitinib is mainly for the child books A patients. So, uh, what is this molecular difference for sorafenib? That is also a tyrosine. I mean, for versus regorafenib, it's also a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but it will be acting on multi kinase pathway, VGFR, CK. And uh, TAE and PDG for uh, multiple pathways are being involved, and there are two major metabolites like M2 and M5 in which uh, regorafenib. See, if you are going to take regorafenib, regorafenib, there are four major mechanisms. One is it will be a anti-immunosuppressive, and it will be a anti-proliferative, and next to that it will be anti-apoptotic, and fourth one is anti-angiogenesis. Anti-angiogenesis means it is going to Uh, I mean, involved in the pathway of vascular endothelial growth factor, and uh, and apart from that, anti-immunosuppressive means this immunosuppressive. Uh, I mean, the tumor growth effects, and uh, that will be suppressed. Uh, next to that, anti-proliferative and anti-apoptotic. Anti-apoptotic pathways like BCL, APAX, all those things is going to be suppressed. So, in, in the, it will be acting on all these four pathways. Regular phenyl. 
So for assessing the efficacy of regorafenib, uh, resorstrel is being used. See the dose being tried for regorafenib is 160 milligrams per oral QD. And when we see when you are going to see, this is the second line therapy. Suppose if you are going to use uh, sorafenib for the initial time, I mean, uh, if the patient is not going to respond or the worsening of symptoms, and uh, usually it will be thinking in terms of after 20 days of initiation of sorafenib over the 28 days duration period. So if it is not going to respond, then we can consider the patient for regorafenib and other things. So patient with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma who tolerated well with the first line sorafenib but progressed uh, with the BCLC, I mean, who is just progressing with the disease. And if the patient is having, I mean, ECOG performance status, if it is less than two, and BCLC, either B or C, and Chaipux A will be taken into an account. So 160 milligrams QD uh, usually be trying until the uh, I mean, uh, unacceptable, unacceptable acceptable toxicity or uh, progression of disease uh, being enrolled. We need to continue the therapy. And uh, the primary endpoints as well as secondary endpoints will be assessed. And the resource trail, what they have been mentioning about, uh, the overall survival is 10.6. And uh, when compared to survival, I mean, uh, uh, first line therapy and the median progression free survival is around 3.1 when compared to 1.5 in the first line therapy. So, these are the common adverse effects. Uh, as we all know, that the common things for tyrosine kinase inhibitor the same one and uh, and food skin reactions, diarrhea, fatigue, hypertension. So, if you're going to think about uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the hypertension will be slightly more as well as and food skin reaction will be slightly more. And uh, the other effects like uh, acetes and anemia formation and abdominal pain will be slightly less when you're going to use a uh, regular opinion. So, next line of molecule which has been tried is cabosanchanib. So, if you're going to use cabosanchanib, it's based upon the celestial trial. So, in that also, the common adverse effects will be a form of plantar, I mean, and food reaction, diarrhea, fatigability, everything. But cabosanchanib, uh, diarrhea and decreased appetite will be in a slightly higher preponderance when compared to hypertension and vomiting will be slightly in lower preponderance. And so, what is a celestial trial in being assessing cabosanchanib for the previously treated? As I told you, once a patient being initiated with sorafenib, if the patient is not going to respond and the patient is being previously treated patients, so if the patient has signs of further worsening, so we need to add cabasanchinib can be tried. So the one good thing about cabasanchinib, it will be preventing the metastatic pathway. So it will be going to involve the MET, MET gene, MET oncogene pathway, it is going to involve, as well as the AXL pathway is going to be involved and in advanced hepatocellular carcinoma who experience progression of disease after initiation of sorafenib. So if the patient, so the dose of sorafenib can, I mean, uh, cabalsanchinib can be tried is approximately 60 milligrams per oral QED until the benefits is going to accept, until there's a progression of disease and the primary and secondary endpoints you being assessed. Uh, in, this, uh, in this celestial trial, what are the mentioned is compared to the placebo, the median overall survival is slightly high and the progression free survival is also high and compared to the placebo. So cabalsanchinib is being validated now. So what is the next line of molecule we can consider is ramucirumab. Ramucirumab is based upon, based upon the REACH2 trial. In, me, in this study, what has been taken into account is the alpha fetoprotein levels of more than 400 nanograms. So mainly why they are taking alpha fetoprotein? Because in this patients in the advanced SCC, if the AFP bit is going to be more, the BCLC, BRC, and Chaipux A, and the ECOG criteria if it is one, if you are going to put the patient with ramucirumab uh, along with uh, best supporting care and in placebo support arm, if you are going to see at the rate of 8 mg per kg, if you are going to switch over the patient with ramucirumab, that is uh, the primary endpoints of overall survival will be uh, reasonably good. See, if you're going to see ramucirumab arm, in this case, it will be around 8.5 months of survival and compared to the median overall survival, also progression-free survival, will also be slightly high in 2.8 months and compared to the placebo. So, the common adverse effects like fatigability, peripheral edema, decreased appetite, abnormal pain, nausea, diarrhea. So, as we all remember that tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these are the common side effects when compared to a checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so always because checkpoint inhibitors can present with the autoimmune phenomena also, and this tyrosine kinase inhibitors predominantly will be having a, a GA symptoms along with and food skin reaction can occur. 
And what are the, see, this is the outline about the systemic therapy is being tested in phase three for the management of advanced HCC. So if you're going to combine therapy, like uh, as we all know that the local regional therapy is still more validated. And when you're going to use a local regional therapy being combined with the first line molecules like sorafenib and other thing, how the patient is going to improve. And there is other regimen like Fox, other regimens being considered. And uh, these are all being tried. I mean, uh, uh, not, not much of benefit, but we can add a slightly progression free survival and slightly progressed oral survival is there. When you're going to use the Fox regimen along with uh, uh, and other drugs. So in the second line treatment, like Ivorolim, Stivacinib, Amusinib, Brimanib, and Cabazanchinib, and Ramuracinib, Ragorafinib, multiple drugs are being tried. And next to that, what is this uh, nivolumab? So as we all know that uh, nivolumab is a checkmate for 40 in being advanced trial. It's a checkmate inhibitor, which means it is going to act on anti-PD-1 pathway. It's a pro progression of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, progression to cell death receptor apoptotic pathway it is going to involve. So when you are going to use nivolumab at the rate of 0.1 mg per kg. See, I would like to insist on that. Uh, if you're going to try nivolumab in hepatitis C after sorafenib is still more considered, and there are some trials being proven that. So, but the beneficial effect in hepatitis B is still a doubtful issue. But even then, we uh, in hepatitis C is slightly better when compared to hepatitis B if you're going to use nivolumab in advanced SSC. And uh, uh, the dose of initiation will be 0.3 mg per kg, and we are going to escalate the dose up to 1 mg per kg. And, uh, slowly we'll be accelerating up to 3 mg per kg. And we can combine nivolumab with other li drug like, uh, so many other drugs being trialed, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and all can be tried. But uh, the question, the benefit is still, uh, uh, benefit of it is still in trials. So after that, so efficacy in dose. So if you're going to treat this, uh, HCV infected and HPV infected, uh, in, in nivolumab, the HCV rate of improvement is slightly better when compared to the HPV infected patients. If you're going to see the overall survival in HCV infected patients will be around 85 by 81 and compared to HPV infected will be only 84 by 70. So reasonable overall survival in HCV infected and other infected patients when you're going to use nivolumab. So uh, the common adverse effects will be uh, autoimmune pathology can happen. So around 15% of vasculitis, autoimmune pathology, I mean, uh, pneumonitis and other complications is mean are uh, reported when you are going to use uh, drugs like uh, checkpoint inhibitors like Nivolibar and other drugs. And common adverse events will be a uh, fatigability, pruritus, rash and diarrhea and also being commonly encountered. The other, other drugs like uh, pembrolizumab. So what is the role of pembrolizumab in patients previously treated? So uh, if you're going to use pembrolizumab at the rate of 200 milligrams uh, for every third weekly, so in patients with advanced SCC, well, intolerable. So you, these kind of patients, once the initiation of sorafenib, the patient becomes intolerable to that and you're going to try with other line of uh, molecules like pembrolizumab. And there are so many other molecules like uh, uh, even bivaxizumab and uh, other molecules being still tried. But uh, pembrolizumab, when you're going to use approximately 200 mg every Third weekly, uh, we are being intolerant to sorafenib and childhood A and uh, BCLC perform BCLC stage B or C and with the ECOG staging of uh, approximately performance will be a reasonably good one. And with the life expectancy of approximately more than three months, definitely we can try our uh, pembrolizumab and the primary endpoint and the overall survival uh, is slightly more better when compared to a patient who have been non-treated. So this is a keynote, uh, I mean, pembrolizumab, if you're going to see as checkmate trial, this is key mate trial, uh, key, keynote 224 is a response across the etiology. See, if you're going to see uh, uninfected patient, the patient infected with hepatitis C and the patient infected with hepatitis B status. Uh, so the chances of pembrolizumab, the response will be more pertinent, will be in patients with infected with hepatitis C rather than in hepatitis B related patients. So the overall survival and the best overall response, the disease control will be very good in case of pembrolizumab also uh, when you're going to consider it in the, late in the field. So what are the various adverse events like uh, uh, liver enzyme alteration, diarrhea, and as I told you, the immune vasculitis, immune, immune related pathology like hepatitis, pneumonitis, UAIDs, other things can flare up and these things can happen. So pembrolizumab is a keynote trend, uh, as I told you, uh, if you're going to combine with the best support you can and in other patients with SCC uh, who have been previously treated for SCC, 
uh, is intolerable if you're going to I mean come uh, on after serafinib with ECOG performance and DCOC if you're going to drink we can consider so in our censure on uh, MMC uh, what we have tried actually we have taken one or three patients and among them around 88 will be male which was happened uh, in 2015 to 17 and uh, uh, in female patients around uh, 25 patients being taken into an account and that the oral age group of survival have been age group, uh, these kind of populations being involved. And uh, we have been assessed the performance status, histopathology, and HBSAD positive cases will be approximately 44, and hepatitis C virus positivity will be approximately 40, and the alcohol etiology will be approximately one or three other things. And if you're going to assess the BCLC, most of the patients will be in advanced stage. If you're going to see in our center work they have been experienced, most of the patients when you are going to come will be in advanced stage around 35, and the terminally ill stage will be in the, around 56% of the patients is still there. And we are being trying with uh, sorafenib and the supportive care also of the reasonable improvement of patients with sorafenib. And the median survival has been recorded in our center it will be approximately uh, six months, definitely median survival is there, and with supporting care will be approximately three months. So before concluding, so always you need to consider the treatment for advanced in hepatic cellular carcinoma. Uh, either you are going to consider the first line therapy of sorafenib or lenvacinib, along with other immunotherapies, checkmate inhibitors like uh, nivolumab and uh, pembrolizumab or uh, cabacitrol can be tried. And along with that, the second line drugs like regorofenib, and other drugs are still in phase three style will be going on for pembrolizumab and other drugs. And now axitinib also has been considered in the field for the trial line trial. So finally, before concluding, early stage, either you need to go for surgery or transplant. Intermediate, you need to go for taste. And advanced, always you need to go for uh, sorafenib and other therapy. And uh, the combination therapy and local regional therapy, sorafenib is still more validated. And along with local regional therapy, sorafenib we can consider. So if you're going to start the patient on management for advanced hepatitis cellular carcinoma, we need to mention, we need to take care of the adverse events. We need to counsel the patient. And moreover, when you're going to initiate the patient with lenvatinib, uh, the cost of the drug is slightly less when compared to the initial primary sorafenib in the market. So lenvatinib is slightly more potent and it is slightly more used nowadays in the field of uh, management of advanced in hepatitis cellular carcinoma. So overall, you need to assess the tumor status, the performance status, the histological pattern, the progression of the disease, the clinical presentation, how the patient is going to manifest, whether the patient is having a cirrhotic background or a non cirrhotic background, or what is the etiological factor, what is the child status we are going to treat, what is the performance status, what is the ECOG scoring, based upon all these parameters we are going to take into account before starting a patient with advanced uh, chemotherapeutic regimens in the management of advanced epitacellar carcinoma as to be strongly considered. Thanking you all for your patient listening and I'm happy to answer your questions if anything is there to take over. Hello, am I audible yes. now? Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Sibi. Yeah, that was a fantastic presentation, uh, Dr. Arun. Uh, it was a comprehensive talk on uh, every aspect of hepatocellular cellular carcinoma, uh, including the latest uh, monoclonal antibodies that are available for the treatment. Some of the questions, um, uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about the effect of uh, primary disease on the prognosis of hepatocellular cellular carcinoma? So effect of the primary disease on the prognosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, see there are multiple trials if you're going to use. See mainly if it is going to be the etiological factor, either it is because of alcohol or is it because of hepatitis B or hepatitis C. See if you're going to be alcohol based etiology, the chances of progression for hepatocellular carcinoma, even if it happens, the chances of survival overall response will be around 19 to 20% when compared to hepatitis B and C, it will be around 16 to 70%. So uh, the etiological factor is being strongly considered when you are going to uh, manage a patient with hepatitis. And moreover, in non cirrhotic background, background or even in metabolic disease background, the etiological factor in management of hepatitis cellular carcinoma with this, with this clinical performance status has to be taken into account when you are going to manage it. Fantastic. And the other question is, uh, what are the various markers that are used for the evaluation of angiogenesis? In a patient who has hepatocellular carcinoma and uh, 
is there uh, any implication of these factors on the prognosis of hepatocellular carcinoma see as i discussed with you sir the angiogenesis pathway is mainly based upon the vascular endothelial growth factors and angiogenesis is nothing but anything which is involved in the tumor proliferation and anything which is going to involve in the sprouting of the new vessels in the existing pre and the pre existing vessels so there are multiple pathways vascular endothelial platelet derived and multiple fibroblast growth factor many multiple factors are being involved in angiogenesis among that the quantification is still more going for uh, see we should remember that there are some anti angiogenesis factor factor also like i mean endostatin angiostatin so many things are being there and uh, and the constituents what we are going to angiogenesis factor like cox in you come cox see uh, was cox 2 levels and vascular endothelial growth factors along with cd31 and uh, uh cd105 other things have been still tried if you are going to use uh, the markers the biomarkers can be considered as we all know that not only uh, the biomarker for hepatocellular carcinoma the angiogenesis proliferation the hot antibody assessment is still more validated when you are going to initiate the treatment protocol guidelines fantastic and the other question is what is the impact of the levels of alpha fetoprotein on the treatment efficacy as i told you when you are discussing with the trial of reach the ramorosimab if you are going to use uh, i mean if the uh, alpha fetal protein levels if it is going to be more than 400 there is a slightly a more response and when compared to sorafenib the overall response and overall survival uh, if the alpha fetal protein levels is going to be high it's slightly uh, less in sharp trial uh, when compared to the trial of reach when you are going to use uh, regorafenib so alpha fetal protein definitely is having a good uh, response outcome and we need to assess uh, the alpha fetal protein levels and we need to see the tumor doubling time and based upon that we need to manage the patient and uh, uh, how long i mean the survival rate uh, the overall survival rate alpha fetal protein is high means we, in, the, in the case of sorafenib arm will be around 3 to 6 months and if the patient alpha fetal protein level is low will be more than 6 months in the case of sorafenib trial and arm also in the asia pacific trial fantastic um if the other question is uh, um uh, treatment efficacy in cases of macrovascular invasion and then um, metastatic diseases macrovascular in- invasion specifically so if the patient presents to us with evidence of macro macrovascular invasion and the evidence of metastatic disease the possibility of treatment efficacy in advanced hepatocellular carcinoma definitely will be less but when you are going to use sorafenib uh, the response rate uh, when compare if the patient doesn't present to you with a macrovascular invasion means the chances of survival will be approximately around uh, 15 to 18 months but if the patient presents to you with evidence of macrovascular invasion the chances of survival definitely is going to come down for around 9 to 10 months so chances of survival overall survival and chances of time to progress of the disease based upon two major entities and one is by vascular invasion and one is by the extra hepatic metastases so mac uh, and also when we are going to take lenalidine and other molecules uh, if you are going to see the macrovascular invasion the chances of survival will also be less when you are going to use lenalidine and other drugs in the field okay and the next question is uh specific treatment options in cases of hepatocellular carcinoma especially in case of advanced hepatocellular carcinoma with respect to hepatitis b and hepatitis c viruses can you talk on these two specific uh, uh, cases which we are uh, more commonly to see in our clinical practice so as i told you sir the common etiology for any hepatocellular carcinoma to happen is hepatitis b c alcohol and other things to be considered and if you are going to manage a patient with hepatitis b in sharp trial as i told you uh, the chances of survival the chances of progression of the disease uh, i mean uh, uh, the I mean uh, the overall response in sharp trial uh, if you are going to put the patient uh, with sorafenib for hepatitis b virus patient uh, in this likely uh, a difficult one to target because hepatitis c virus and alcohol based etiology the impact will be slightly good with uh, sorafenib based therapy nowadays even lenalidine and other molecules even regorafenib has been tried uh, based upon the uh, clinical impacts okay and uh, what are the common adverse effects that we are to see with uh, all these drugs which are used to treat advanced hepatocellular carcinoma 
so when you are using as i told you always we need to divide the adverse reactions any adverse reaction whether we need to be whether it's a early adverse early reaction or whether it is a late reaction so most common early reactions could be a nausea vomiting it could be arterial symptoms it could be vascular mean uh, hypertension other symptoms can happen in the early phase but usually an two reaction will be occurring in the phase of around 7 days around 6 to 7 days of the initiation of therapy but the late reaction could be a cardiovascular pathology and the late reactions could be a renal issues and other complications can be a late phenomena rather than initiating in the early phase so always when you are starting a therapy the overall response you need to be assessed on uh, the clinical progression of the disease has to be assessed and sequential monitoring is to be done when you are tackling a patient with epidural carcinoma okay that was a comprehensive explanation and um, in case of locally advanced hepatocellular cell carcinoma you we use sorafenib to treat isn't it yes sir and uh, sorafenib many people who are intolerant to sorafenib what are the alternative treatment options that are available in case uh, of local... it's a fantastic question sir to answer uh, if the patient is intolerant to sorafenib ideally what they are telling him if the patient is intolerant to any tyrosine kinase inhibitor Uh, uh the possibility of intolerability with other tyrosine kinase inhibitors is also more chance is also high and moreover the other drugs uh, except for lenalidine which is not available uh, in most of your countries and not available in india also and uh, when you are going to use uh, sorafenib widely you can withhold the drug for some time at least for the time being and you can slowly reintroduce the drug at a lower dose and followed by you need to augment the first you give a hodi dose followed by you augment the dose to bd and to assess the clinical response and uh, if the patient develops a severe phenomena then we can continue with the drug and we can consider for the second line regimen but the early mild symptoms no need to stop the regimen completely a slight withholding for around 5 uh, to 7 days followed by we can restart the therapy most of the time if the patient is intolerant to sorafenib oh fantastic so i think uh, only that much questions are there so that was a comprehensive uh, presentation and the answers given uh, for the questions that were also are also uh, up to the point so uh that's it from my end actually and uh, before Hi. concluding i would like to say only one thing when you are going to use local regional therapy like hepatic artery infusion i mean uh, hiz infusion therapy when you are going to use chance and tear regimen and there are multiple trials is going on for uh, sorafenib along with lenalidine and other drugs is being compared so local regional therapy mainly we need to consider for a patient who doesn't have any metastatic who is having evidence of vascular invasion uh i mean without any metastasis has to be done so only for that kind of patients we'd be considering local regional therapy so local regional therapy i didn't discuss separately because that's a separate entity to be discussed in the protocol of management of hepatic cell carcinoma but still more trials being combined when you are going to use in the management of scc in advanced scc along with the sorafenib and other molecules and uh, anything else sir was a very fantastic talk dr arun uh, and even the way you handled the rapid fire questions is also very commendable uh, thank you good sir job, good job thank you Over thank you sir so uh, yeah uh, i really appreciate uh, dr arun's effort it was a, indeed a lucid and in detail presentation regarding management of advanced hepatic cellular carcinoma uh, i also thank uh, dr cb thoran and dr krishna for moderating the session uh i also would like to thank all the clinicians who are watching this program live uh, thank you for sparing your valuable time uh, i hope you all of you have liked like this program if you like this program please let us know in a comment box uh, this is the end of this webinar uh, thank you once again and have a good day thank you sir thank you thank you thank you all